How do you stop your trainees or clients or marketing PR comms professionals from being boring in interviews, but also getting across the key message? I think you have to establish yeah, very firmly with them that they are there to be themselves. They really aren't there to uh, uh, to be some sort of vanilla, as you put it, or corporate droid. That's a good question. Uh, I once media trained somebody who actually had anger management issues. Not that they told me that before I arrived. And this felt <laughs> very big. Let's flip that. Who's amazing at media interviews? Who do you see that is just authentic, polished, just gets it right every time? This, I'm going to look a bit anoraki here, uh, so I'll apologise for that in advance. But the hype that Russell T. Davis has managed to build up for the new Doctor Who is just astonishing, mm-hmm. given that uh, the ratings were on the floor this time last year. Accidental leaks, uh, which uh, don't look terribly accidental to me. Welcome to Socially Acceptable, the only podcast for marketers and communication professionals that celebrates the biggest mistakes and helps you learn their practical lessons so you can grow your brand quicker. We dive deep into the stories from well-known brands and expert marketers who've made those mistakes, learned their lessons and come back from adversity. Just in case this is your first episode, I'm your host, Chris Norton, and I'm joined by my good colleague, Will Ockenden. I've worked in PR and marketing for more than 25 years in a number of international agencies, and I also taught public relations at a number of universities. But 13 years ago, I founded Prohibition to do PR differently with a focus on business impact. Today, Prohibition is listed in the top 10 PR agencies in the north of the UK and turns over more than seven figures every year. In this week's episode, we have Guy Clapperton. Guy is an experienced media trainer and an award-winning journalist. He helps individuals and organisations communicate effectively with the media, both in print and on camera. His training has been praised by clients from a wide range of industries and has been featured in major outlets such as the BBC, The Guardian and The Wall Street Journal. He describes himself as the media trainer and he helps you avoid being misquoted. In this week, Guy covers everything to do with media training, why it's important, what you can do, what practical tips you can give to your C-suite, what you can do yourself, how you can prepare for an interview, Radio 4, and I asked him about a Radio 5 interview, just as an example. It's, it's packed with tips and practical advice that you can take away. So I hope you love this episode. So sit back, relax, and let's all learn how we can all do media interviews better. Welcome to Socially Unacceptable, from f***ups to fame, the marketing podcast that celebrates the professional mishaps, mistakes and misjudgments while delivering valuable marketing and life lessons in the time it takes you to eat your lunch. Hi everybody, welcome back to Socially Unacceptable. This week we're delighted to be joined by uh, a media trainer, an ex-journalist and podcaster himself, uh, Mr Guy Clapperton. Welcome to the show, Guy. What do you mean a media trainer? I'm the media trainer. How very dare you? Hello, how are you, Chris? <laughs> An exceptionally dry media trainer. Is that, is that fair? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fully dry this morning, I promise. <laughs> okay, so do you want to tell us a little bit about um, what a media trainer does and what, what you do, uh, the media trainer, what, what you do at your end? Sure. Uh, what I've been doing over the last 30 years as a journalist is uh, basically I've been one of those journalists who goes into an interview, assumes they're the expert because they've uh, done a bit of research, and then leads the interviewee around and uh, uh, you basically dominates the interview. And as a media trainer, I try to get people into the position so that they can take a bit of control of their own interviews and sh- make sure their expertise gets through rather than just serves the journalists, serving the journalists' agenda. Uh, because because that, I think, is how they will serve their company better, but also how they'll serve the audience better. Uh, It's sunk in gradually over the years that, you know, when I was, say, a 27-year-old reporter on technology, uh, I'd never built a computer. I had no real technical expertise. My expertise was in interviewing. It was in writing. So I try to make sure that people can, uh, my my team and I try to make sure that people can uh, uh, sort of meet people where they are and, uh, uh, you know, share their expertise, speak a bit in journalese and make sure that their message, uh, their expertise gets shared in an efficient way. Whether they're talking to a journalist or whether they're on stage or or, or on uh, Zoom doing a presentation. I do a lot of work with people on presentations as well. So, um, Guy, uh, a a conversation I often have with with our clients is, um, do I need media training? Now, you know, you get often a lot of chief executives or senior people 
um, who are probably quite confident at presenting in front of a crowd and, and they, they say they don't need media training. Um, would you disagree with that? Do you think everybody needs it if they're going to be speaking with the media? I think it's always useful. There are going to be natural performers everywhere uh, in, in fields. I was doing some training just a couple of days ago with some very young people and uh, the company had sent me some clips of uh, kids being interviewed, literally sort of 13, 14 year old kids being interviewed to use purely for that session. Uh, so I'd sort of built them into the session. One or two of those kids had obviously had no training whatsoever, but they waited until the interview had stopped. Uh, interviewer had stopped. Uh, they uh, then came out with a, uh, an answer that had a good beginning, a good end, and that included the question in the answer. So you could just cut it about and use it as if you were, uh, uh, you know, whether you wanted to have the interviewer in the clip or not. So there are people out there who can do it naturally. Mostly, though, if you ask the ch those chief executives, you know, what do you do when you're going to be presenting to a crowd? They'll say, well, I practice for, for a while. I um, write the speech in advance. I rehearse it. And they'll you say, yeah, of course you do. Now, so what do you do when you're going to talk to a journalist who might, by the way, be presenting this to, say, 10,000 people, uh, which is many, many times that crowd that you're going to be speaking to? That's when they think they can just do it without any practice, without any forethought. And that is not a good idea uh, because they're there to promote something and they've got a vast audience. And not only have they got a vast audience, they've got an independent person to filter it through. Uh, you know, they've got to make sure that that message gets through that person. And that can be a really good sanity check, by the way, because they, you know, there's, there's a good role for a journalist to say, well, that's just nonsense, or that doesn't make sense, or I don't think people are going to understand that. Can you explain it differently? So I'm not denigrating the role of the journalist there by any means. But, I, you know, there are people out there who think they, they don't need rehearsal just because mm -hmm. they are the experts in their subject. It doesn't make you an expert at doing interviews. It doesn't actually make you an expert at uh, doing presentations all the time either. So, so, Guy, what are the most common mistakes that comms and marketing people make when dealing with the media in an interview? It's got better and better over the years. Uh, I remember when I was, uh, uh, many years ago, there was, uh, uh, I was on the staff of a publication and there was one PR person who'd always refer to an article I'd written for them. Uh, actually, I didn't work for them, funnily enough. <laughs> it's, uh, I worked for the, uh, the publication I was working for at the time, but they always saw it as their article. Uh, so I think uh, claiming ownership of uh, the journalist is a mistake that uh, some PR people make. And it's only a little sort of niggle in practical terms. It makes no difference whatsoever. Some people think that they're going to be able to, and this happens particularly internationally because uh, cultures are different, but some people think they're going to be able to check the copy before you actually publish. Uh, in the UK, certainly, that's a big no-no. Um, in France, not so much, uh, so I understand. Uh, they, they, um, the, the journalists won't react badly when you, uh, when you make the request. Uh, so, um, but, you know, the, the other thing I find that comms people do occasionally is if I go in and do a presentation or yeah, then uh, they'll say, good, and Guy will share the presentation afterwards, which might well be fine, but they haven't asked me first. You know, it's my intellectual property and they forget to ask me. You know, they just assume uh, that it's theirs, which doesn't <laughs> always help. And what about in the heat of the actual interview then? So, you know, we've got, we've got a chief exec. We've worked hard to get an opportunity in front of the business editor of The Times for the sake of argument. What can go wrong in that heat of the moment? Uh, well, first, they can fail to take your briefing seriously. Uh, some, you know, you, you will have uh, worked on a briefing document. You'll have told them about the journalist. You'll have told them about uh, the publication, and you'll have told them about some key facts. I'm assuming that goes almost without saying. Some chief executives or some junior people, let's not say it's just the seniors, they will have a look and they'll think, oh, yeah, I know all this stuff, and they'll give it two minutes. And then the journalist asks a question they weren't necessarily expecting, and you'll come out with, well, that's not in the script. I've actually heard people say that's not in the script. <laughs> do you know what? Journalists are not actors. We don't do scripts. Um, the, um, uh, or they assume that uh, the journalist is part of their marketing operation. Of course you want to use your interview for marketing. That's, uh, that's well understood. But the journalist is there strictly to be independent. And then you get the, uh, the other one, the other howler. And I know you're both going to recognize this, which is when someone says, oh, by the way, that bit was off the record. Hmm. Uh, like I'm going to rec remember which bit was off the record, which bit wasn't off the record, and had I agreed to off the record in the first place? Um, these days, well, since about 1998, I think, I've not done off the record at all because I I don't 
I don't need to be given the job of managing somebody else's communications. Mm. Uh, if you don't want to tell me the readers something, don't tell me. Do, do, do you want to explain what on the record and off the record is for our listeners? I think it's worth um, diving into that. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I have had. I've seen this go wrong many times. I actually saw on LinkedIn a media training company saying uh, recently that off the record means, uh, please, you may refer to this, but don't say uh, that I told you. That's unattributable. That's not off the record. Off the record means you've told somebody something on deep background. In other words, uh, that uh, you've told somebody something that they must not repeat, but there's something they need to know in order to inform uh, their um, uh, the, the piece they're writing. Say they've made some assumption based on some financial results and the accounting rules had changed and they weren't aware of that. You can't be seen saying uh, my uh, financial results have been a bit skewed by this new financial ruling. Uh, but, um, you're, uh, yeah, it, but, but the journalist will be saying you're making less money than you are uh, if, um, if they don't know that. So you might give them something like that on strict off the record stuff so that they'll that uh, they won't refer to the fact that even the interview has taken place. Yeah, because what always interests me on the news is when they say, you, you see like Laura Koonsberg or one of the political editors, I can't remember his name on the BBC at the moment, um, the, 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 the chap, what's he called? Chris Mason. Chris Mason, that's it. And he'll say like, he'll say like on the, um, yeah, publicly, they're talking about this and da 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 da, but in the back streets of Westminster, privately, they're talking about this. And I'm thinking, who's briefing him privately? That that's all off the record, isn't it? But that isn't what you're talking about in the commercial world, I suppose, because most people say on the, on off the record doesn't really exist. I, I agree. I always say in my media training sessions that off the record doesn't exist, or if it does, then it's the hands of the public in the hands of the public relations experts, not in the hands of the first time interviewee. Uh, so, uh, because you know, you need those understandings. You need to be absolutely certain the journalist understands it. And there's famous cases. You know, it's not just politics. Um, I was training somebody yesterday, and I mentioned that uh, in 1970, I think it was, John Lennon told a journalist that he was splitting up the Beatles, but don't tell anybody. So the journalist, good as his word, didn't tell anybody. And then, of course, when Paul McCartney announced that he was uh, having to take legal action to split up the Beatles, and it, all the headlines were Paul McCartney split up the Beatles, the poor journalist gets an angry call from John Lennon saying, I split up the Beatles, why am I not getting credit? And he said, because you told me not to tell anybody. And Lennon said, I didn't mean don't tell anybody, I meant tell everybody. So, you know, you do get, I'm, I'm not suggesting Lennon was media trained, I was only five at the time, so I wasn't available, but uh, I, I'm... You do get people misunderstanding it. So my advice to clients is always steer clear. And from your perspective, then, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, we're not going to start naming names. What kind of, well, in fact, um, what, what media interview disasters have you seen recently? I mean, one that springs to my mind is Hannah Ingram Moore um, on Pierce Morgan that just kind of was a slow motion car crash, wasn't it? As, as uh, Pierce Morgan slowly tightened the screw and, uh, and and really put her under pressure. Have you have you seen any in the media recently that you thought, God Almighty, they should have uh, they should have prepared better for that? I suppose when you're looking at media disasters, you have to look at uh, politicians because they're so public. And uh, the, there is our old friend Nadine Dorries, who uh, was culture secretary, and came out with gems like Channel Four having to be privatised so that it could commission more programmes from independent producers when actually the fact was uh, that it was um, uh, Channel 4 was uh, it, it has always commissioned programmes exclusively from independent producers. Also, the fact she said it shouldn't be funded by pa taxpayers' money, which it never wa was. So, you know, that just didn't happen. Uh, so, you know, it's when politicians get facts wrong. But then these days, they just uh, they, they keep digging. They just stand by them completely. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, um, uh, the the Captain Tom Moore example was also particularly egregious. This idea of saying, you know, but we need this spa uh, when it's just this hideous building. I think that was just horrible. What tips do you provide to your clients to help them stay composed and deliver key messages effectively, especially when facing really tough journalist questions? That's a good question. Uh, I once media trained somebody who actually had anger management issues. Not that they told me that before I arrived. And this fellow was very big and probably an ex-rugby player or whatever. Uh, but they... Um, what we agreed was that uh, when I was asking, let's call him Brian, it wasn't his name, uh, but when... Um, I asked him a really difficult and horrible question. Uh, 
he wouldn't think this is guy being horrible to Brian. It was this is journalist being being horrible to chief executive. So it was job title to job title. I think you've got to take a step back in your head and uh, not play that journalist's game. Never forget that unless the journalist has taken the precaution of buying shares in your company or is also your line manager somehow, the journalist has no particular right to ask you questions. You're doing them a favour. You are helping them by asking. It may be a mutually beneficial favour, and it probably will be. Uh, so most of those opportunities are really good opportunities. But don't feel that you have to answer or that you are not allowed to take notes in. You know, it's not an episode of Mastermind or Dragon's Den or something. It's uh, an interview, and they're seriously trying to get uh, accurate stuff out of you. And um, which... Um which journalists? I know a few years ago it always used to be Jeremy Paxman on Newsnight, didn't it? Who was who was the journalist that gave um, you know chief executives and politicians the biggest grilling? Who, in your view, is it now that's the kind of the the most uh, you know the pit bull terrier of journalists? Is it Piers Morgan? Is it somebody else? Nick Robinson. Uh, Piers Morgan is in that category, although he tends to go for the populist, rather shouty. Um, uh, uh, shouty approach, uh, which means I'm not in his audience, but I certainly accept that uh, he is uh, very tenacious and will uh, keep hold people to account. I also look at uh, Nick Robinson on the Today programme, who I think is equally uh, tenacious, rather more polite. And uh, just coming along the um, uh, the sideline, Amal Rajan of the Today programme is also um, holding people to account very well. But above all, and I'm a bit of a Today programme fan, you can probably see the um, uh, pattern emerging. Uh, hmm. Michelle Hussein is coming in for a lot of stick because she's um, uh, because she's uh, refusing to back down when people say she should do. And uh, if you're getting that much stick, you're probably getting something right. So I think I have a lot of time for her as well. Yeah. The Today programme are very, very good at it. I think anybody that's going on the Today programme, you need to prepare very, very carefully. Um, how, how do you gauge the success mm. of media training initiatives then? Do you have like key performance indicators? How, do you, how can you tell that someone's gone from being um, a distinctly average interview to a, a, an exceptional candidate for an interview? I think uh, it's all about how the interview came out, whether the journalist actually did record their messages and uh, re reproduce them, which is basically a matter of making sure the journalist understands the importance of the messages, which goes back to don't put rubbish messaging in. Uh, you know, make sure that you're actually saying something coherent, make sure you're saying something worthwhile so that the journalist will actually be incentivized to uh, make a better story using your messages. Uh, you know, I've certainly been in situations where people have said the message is we are a quality company. Well, frankly, until somebody says we're not a quality company, we're a bit rubbish, um, I won't be um, regarding that as a quality message any, any time. But I think it's a matter of whether they've thought through what uh, the message is and whether it's any good. Also, whether they've thought through what's going to happen next. I've had people saying things like, I want to get into the Financial Times because I want to sell more mobile phones or whatever. And no one ever looked at the or bought the Financial Times, intending to do uh, uh, to um, find out which mobile phone to buy next. They'll buy something else. Uh, so it's a matter of looking at that outcome and how likely it is that that's going to happen as a result of your message. To what degree should we kind of rehearse and practice prior to a media in interview? I mean, obviously, you know, we 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 we're advocating an element of training. But, you know, we, if we have a big interview set up, should we kind of do a dress rehearsal um, beforehand um, in order to kind of test every possible angle? I think that's a good idea as long as uh, you don't end up just learning a script. Uh, there's a lovely, um, I say lovely, uh, interview with um, uh, Ed Miliband online. It's ages old uh, and uh, there's been a school strike and he's asked six questions and he just comes out with the same platitude, word for oh. word with some of the clauses in the sentence slightly rearranged. Uh, he, um, he just, but it's, he just comes up with the same old tosh every single time, and uh, he looks a complete muppet. Although one of the young people I was training a couple of days ago thought he was pretty good, so it, this could be just my rather jaded middle-aged um, view coming out. <laughs> so, so uh, but I think it's a matter of making sure that people can cover their key points rather than making sure they um, uh, they stick to a specific script because that's always going to look bad. If you want to uh, recite a script, hire an actor. So there's been an interesting article in The Telegraph that, I, that I've tweeted recently, and it was basically by a guy called Ben Lawrence, and it was it was on the effect that PR and publicity spin is killing the TV interview with celebrities, and very much about what we're talking about here, in that if you think of footballers, you think of politicians, they give 
boring vanilla answers. And to the point where the David Beckham documentary on Netflix was created by his PR team, uh, supposedly, allegedly, in brackets, close brackets. Um, and then the more recent one has been Robbie Williams. And then this article in particular was saying, thank God for Pete Doherty and Louis Theroux. Because obviously on, I think it was Sunday or Monday, there was a Louis Theroux inter- is doing a series of interviews, Anthony Joshua, um, and he's recently interviewed Pete Doherty. Pete is a very charismatic crazy individual that brings the chaos but he's also he's got a beautiful um like intelligence to him and he's he's, he's quite, he, ben lawrence talks about him being fragile and the fact that louis Theroux is such a good interviewer that it brings some real personality back to celebrity rather than vanilla answers so going back to what you were saying about politicians and giving exactly the point you just made like giving the same answer over and over and over again how do you stop your trainees or clients or marketing PR comms professionals from being boring in interviews, but also getting across the key message. I think you have to establish yeah, very firmly with them that they are there to be themselves. They really aren't there to uh, uh, to be some sort of vanilla, as you put it, or corporate droid or uh, whatever. I was once training a guy who was a 25 year old uh, entrepreneur. He'd made a company worth a million dollars or something at that age. He asked me what sort of persona he should adopt during a uh, media uh, media interview. And I asked him, what do you mean, what sort of persona? I don't understand. And he said, well, people don't really want to hear from some smart aleck 25-year-old who's built up a million-dollar company. And the ironic thing is, you know, that's exactly who people wanted to hear from because that's what he'd done. And uh, there were probably 24-year-olds who'd quite like a piece of that. So, you know, how do they do it? He thought he should sort of try and be a much more mature person, and that's always going to look artificial. Mm. So I just try to persuade mm. people, you know, maybe even watch some of these uh, bland documentaries you've referred to, um, and uh, they will, uh, they'll will they soon get the idea that too much polish is, uh, is a bad idea. And those things do end up very scripted, and they do end up uh, very, very bland. Um, the thing about celebrities is if you want an interview with Robbie Williams, there is ultimately only one person in the entire world who can give you that interview with Robbie Williams. And if you don't want to play his game or his PR people's game, you won't get that interview. So it's a bit different when it's uh, politicians or particularly people in the commercial world who, if Mm. I wanted to interview somebody who was, say, a social media professional or, dare I say, a PR professional, and you guys were being being just too scripted, then um, I can go and talk to someone else instead. Um, whereas that's not possible you know, in uh, Robbie Williams' case or David Beckham's case. Let's say I'm a head of marketing and I'm listening to this show and I've got an interview next week on Radio 5 Live. Um, God knows which show. They've, they've got an interview on Radio 5 Live next week. They've t- 10 minutes to talk about, I don't know, marketing in their sector. Um, what are the three sort of key tips you would give to that person to prepare for that interview? Find out about the audience. What does that Radio 5 Live audience need to know about marketing? If you've got 10 minutes, uh, what are you going to say that's going to prevent them from turning over to <coughs> another radio station at uh, uh, two, one minute, two minutes in? Um, See if you can get three decent messages in there and uh, pepper them around the interview. See if you've uh, they've got to be good messages. They've got to be messages that relate to the Radio 5 Live audience. And uh, treat them as 10 pegs. Catch their attention with uh, the first one. When it's about five minutes in, pop the next one if you can, if you can. Think of it like 10 pegs or a sort of W shape. Uh, and, uh, you know, then finish on a high note if you possibly can. Um, but then... Uh, beyond that, I'd say don't overthink it. Do listen to the questions. Do answer the questions. There is nothing more annoying um, that will get your interview cut short than somebody who just ignores the questions and comes up with their uh, their messages. That's bland. It's boring. It's it's pretty offensive. So um, so three messages is about right. Um, I know I know the media has kind of shifted in in recent years towards kind of an obsession with sound bites, hasn't it? Sh- should we try and get kind of you know, I know politicians are very good at this. Should we try and get sort of um, snackable sound bites into our interviews, or does that become inauthentic and contrived? If you mean them so they don't sound inauthentic and contrived, then um, uh, then I don't think there's anything wrong with them. Politicians mostly do it when they're campaigning, don't forget. So they want people to remember them. They want them to take away. It's almost like a greatest hits thing. But if we just stick with the political uh, image for the moment, let's take two recent conservative leaders of the 73 there have been over the last few years. Uh, if you take, uh, first of all, um, Boris Johnson, um, his um, campaign in 2019, you don't have to like him particularly, but... 
uh, get Brexit done and build back better resonated with enough people to get him a substantial um, uh, majority. Um, there has been a bit of history since, I grant you, but that was what uh, happened in 2019. 2017, Theresa May went around uh, parroting the phrase strong and stable, and she obviously didn't mean it. If you look at um, inter old interviews of her at that stage, uh, she's just sort of saying strong and stable. Strong and stable. She, she's really her heart is not in it, and I think that lost. That's part of what lost her her majority in that instance. She, she threw that away. So, uh, it, it, if you're going to do sound bites, make sure it's something you believe in. Make sure it's something that you say. Make sure you sound authentic. If you're usually given to long, long, long uh, rambling um, uh, statements, I think of that for some reason. <laughs> then uh, you, uh, you then you're not going to sound right if you do these tiny little sound bites. I hear people saying things like, you know, use alliterations, you know, let us uh, start with the same letter on these sound bites, which can work, but the more contrived it sounds, the more the listener, the viewer, the, uh, is going to, uh, the audience is going to go away and think, you've just made that up in advance and you were going to say whatever was asked. So I, I don't underestimate the viewer. The strong and stable thing, the Tories, God, they got, they got beaten with that at the time, didn't they? Just went over and over and over again. What they would do for a bit of strong and stable right now. But yeah, you're right. It became, it, it, it also, it, it, it felt so re re repeated that it was, it was like we were stupid, like the general public were stupid and had to have the same message, strong and stable, strong and stable, over and over again. Um, so uh, you've obviously seen a lot of mistakes and a lot of crises yourself at your end i'm not saying you personally um but if you were involved in what's 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 like some of the worst media accidents or crises you've seen where people have just completely screwed up an interview and it's ruined it's ruined a brand because they've, they've said the wrong thing can you think of any good examples that you use in your training yeah um i think um that, that there's uh, any number you can go all the way back to gerald ratner and the famous we sell crap thing uh one of my training team is actually the mp that uh, or the ex mp now uh that gordon brown was campaigning for when uh, he um, uh, accused that woman of being the bigot from the back of <laughs> i remember uh, the that classic was microphone that, that was brilliant yeah. On. yeah yeah if you watch that uh, if you look at my website you'll see that simon danshuk is on my uh, training team if you look at that uh, clip you'll see that uh, he's actually addressing those comments to simon in the back of uh, the car um and the funny thing is that simon did win that election because he he just thought that uh, uh well in that case we've lost this election you know that, that i might as well take my foot off the pedal there's no point Luckily, as he puts it, so did the Conservatives. <laughs> so uh, they, they just assumed they were going to win. They took it completely mm. for granted. So that's uh, an obvious example. So, you know, it's always a case of make sure the microphone is off. We had uh, just recently Gillian Keegan um, uh, sweating and blinding all over the uh, you know, and saying that uh, her department was doing a great job when a lot of people thought it wasn't. Um, although I do wonder sometimes whether they use that quite deliberately because I don't think yeah, it she looked deliberate, came didn't off it? Particularly, it badly. looked a bit deliberate. Yeah. That I thought it, it, it was it, very it, quick. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, and uh, you know, sort of all these MPs, other, uh, all these others, nameless others, are sitting on their asses. Um, but then it's, you know, some in politics. I mean, we keep getting back to politics, but just because it's so public and uh, it's such good examples of extremes of communication. Uh, we're recording in the week of the Suella Braverman. Um, resignation, sacking, whatever it is, and exchange of angry letters and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, the stuff that happens on the record is uh, as damaging as the stuff that, uh, you know, that's beyond uh, your control is often as damaging as the stuff that can happen by accident. I do think, though, that uh, if you're going to be presenting in public, if you look at the presentation side of my um, business, uh, the best thing you can do is look after the AV people. Uh, the uh, the camera operators, the sound people, because those people will look after you or not. I once did a presentation, or rather I was uh, chairing a, uh, a thing at a, um, a trade show, and I'd been given literally five minutes to get in and prepare because I was doing lots of things at this trade show. I was uh, editing this uh, publication, and it was uh, I was uh, uh, supposed to be introducing lots and lots of speakers. I was doing this panel discussion walked in and um, the AV guy says, oh, by the way, only one of the microphones is working, so I put that in the middle. Um, and uh, you've got the radio mic, that's also working. And I thought, what, yeah, uh, uh, what, hold on, but there's a panel of four people. And he'd set it up so that my chair was one side of the microphone at some distance. The four panelists were uh, a good walk away from the other working microphone. So I had this working mic. So I was introducing people and they were walking up to the microphone saying hello. 
and walking back. I was asking a question, and they were walking up to the microphone and answering it. And it was just so slow. And when it got to the audience q and I thought, well, I can't do this. I've just got to go and lean at people because I had this uh, microphone on that was actually working. Um, and uh, sort of asked them to ask the questions. It was still bad, but that was how I ended up with uh, an entire audience talking to my left man boob. So do look after the um, uh, AV people. Uh, they can turn a, uh, a little bit of a There we go, pro tip, look after disaster. the AV people. I like that. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about kind of disasters and what goes wrong and who's been put under pressure and got it wrong. Let's flip that. Who's amazing at media interviews? Who do you see that is just authentic, polished, just gets it right every time? Well, most people, because I, th- I think the thing is you, um, you watch an interview and you, um, uh, if you don't notice that they've been media trained, then I think that's when they've been really well media trained. Uh, you know, I, um, there's uh, uh, the, the past master of publicity at the moment, I think, is um, now this. I'm going to look a bit anoraki here, uh, so I'll apologize for that in advance. But the hype that Russell T. Davis has managed to build up for the new Doctor Who is just astonishing, mm-hmm. given that uh, the ratings were on the floor this time last year. Uh, and I think, you know, he's given little hints. He's uh, got a whole campaign going on in there. There's been little clips coming out, accidental leaks, uh, which uh, don't look terribly accidental to me. Stuff like that. So I think uh, those people do really well. Uh, but of course, the um, you know in showbiz in celebrity, what the big secret is that none of this really matters. It's these you know the politicians who make decisions about our taxes and about our public services. They're the ones who don't do so well. So um, we haven't really talked about the process of media training. So you guys do specialise in media training. We have, we've got clients that ask us for media training. Sometimes we'll do it. Um, some bits in house because we do a lot of interviews, obviously, but not. You're you're an ex journalist. Do you want to do you want to talk about your process? To you know, if somebody hires you, what's the process to media training for working with Guy Clapperton? Sure, uh, working with um, me or any of my team. Uh, basically, it starts off with uh, a phone call uh, and uh, uh, or a, a Zoom meeting uh, when the connection is slightly better than the one that we're doing at the moment, obviously. <laughs> um, and I ask what the objective is. I think it's it, it's it's quite patronising for people to say, uh, "Well, here's my media training offering. You've got to fit." around it. Uh, first of all, I say, where do you want to get to? Where do you, and I'm sure you do the same with your public relations operation. It's always a matter of where people want to take themselves to. Um, sometimes you find that uh, if you dig a little bit, there's a, an imminent crisis. Sometimes there's been a crisis. Sometimes it's just there's a new PR person who thinks that there may one day be a crisis. And that, by the way, is the time to do the crisis planning um, when there is no crisis. A bit like taking life insurance before you're ill. <laughs> it's uh, you know it's cheaper. So I um, uh, I then have a conversation with them. Uh, I we do take advantage of the fact that I'm a uh, I'm a journalist. Uh, so um, you know you say I'm an ex journalist. I mean the podcast is still very much alive, and uh, you know I do write the odd bits and pieces. But quite honestly, the rates haven't gone up much since I was since the mid uh, 2000s. So uh, that's become less important in my life. But I do regard myself as a current journalist. I um, uh, we will look at uh, good in- interviews and bad interviews. I mentioned the Ed and the Band one. I've uh, got that on YouTube. I show that to them. Uh, we um, we go to um, uh, we then move into uh, interview practice, uh, and that's indispensable. Which is where I use draw on my years of experience interviewing people and just give them a bit of a grilling. Generally, it's best if it's in front of uh, my camera operator as well, our camera expert, I should say. He's an award-winning documentary maker, and I keep referring to him as just the camera operator. I hope he doesn't see this. Uh, Paul Angel, who is superb, and I have a couple of other uh, camera experts as well if uh, he's unavailable. And we, um, uh, we, we, we film, we play back. Um, Paul, with his documentary making expertise, and me with my focus on content, we sort of pick out what could, what, what uh, went wrong, what went right. He focuses more on the body language. I look at the sort of headline that might have come from that particular publication. We look at tips and tricks. We look at how journalists behave. We look at things like how um, to avoid uh, blurting something out because there's an awkward silence. Um, You know, I'm sure you'll have seen journalists asking a question and then uh, just sitting there and uh, the person feels as if they ought to carry on talking. Um, the phrase, does that answer your question, is absolute magic in there because it, it means you've invited them to uh, answer, ask something else if they want. Mm. Um, but um, it, it, and they can't just sit there and wait. We then do a quest, uh, a, another um, uh, interview, pra- interview practice. This time I give them 10 or 15 minutes to prepare. 
and they are often staggered at the amount of um, difference that just that 10 or 15 minutes will make to their focus. And uh, that is where I start, uh, you know, really hammering it home that you should never do an unprepared interview, even if you get a call on your mobile because you're giving that out to someone at a trade show uh, and someone says, I'm a journalist, we met up, can we speak? Then you just say, I'm just about to nip into a meeting, but I'd love to help. Uh, so uh, and that you, you then take five, ten minutes making notes, talking to colleagues, thinking, what can we get out of this? What's that readership going to do next? What's that viewership going to do next? Are they going to buy more stuff? Is it just about thought leadership? Then be the person who calls back and uh, you, uh, rather than just leaves the journalist as a nice to have. And you will start to build a really good relationship. Um, but uh, yeah, we it, so it's mostly a practical uh, session, which does draw on the fact that I've been a journalist for quite some time. This grey stuff on the top of my head is perfectly genuine. Okay. The, you, you just mentioned something about body language there, which I found really interesting. And I think, you know, uh, people can be quite comfortable doing telephone interviews. The moment somebody's on camera, you know, you, you've suddenly got the decision what to do with your hands, haven't you? And you, you get someone like Tony Blair, who very famously, you know, jabs his hands like this. What What's your your view on body language? You know, is, is there any kind of quick fixes to, to looking less awkward on camera? Or should we just, um, should we just kind of I go with I think it's it? not something to be overthought. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not something to be overthought, uh, because I think self-consciousness is often your worst uh, enemy. Uh, if you can get someone else to watch you back on uh, video, then it'll, it's going to be better than watching yourself, because you will notice all of your individual little ticks that no one else is actually going to see. For some reason, over the years, I've developed a, half of, uh, a habit of speaking out of one side of my mouth, which um, <laughs> it irritates me intensely. You probably hadn't even thought about it. Now you're not going to be able to unsee it, and neither is anybody else. I don't know where I, why I started uh, talking about that, but that's one of those things. Um, the other, th but if you're going to be interviewing, say on Zoom uh, or on, as we're doing right now, Riverside FM or Teams or whatever you're doing, and you're being recorded, try to do what I'm very self-consciously doing. If I'd looked at your faces while I'm talking. I start to look down there. I can now see your eyes and making eye contact. But that looks very bad because you're just seeing to, I'm showing off the fact that I haven't got a bald patch, basically, you know, one, one of my <laughs> selling points. Um, good hair, radio, four voice, many of own teeth. Uh, but uh, I'm um, when I'm talking mostly, I'm looking at the camera that's perched on top of my uh, computer there. I'm yeah. pointing at it as if, uh, as if you can see it from there because by definition you can't. But that makes better eye contact and better engagement. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it's a it's a skill you have to work on because the temptation is just to look down at where people actually are. Yeah, uh, and I'm sure I have done the odd glance down here, but it, it does make quite a powerful difference. I do that on webinar. We 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 host webinars like tra free training for marketing people. We do them like once a month, and when we're doing it, we present. Will and I will present um, the latest theory. Our next one's on social media trends. So register at prohibitionpr.co.uk slash events. Uh, anyway, yeah, um, it's coming up. And then, but when we're doing when we're presenting them, all you can. See is the deck you can't actually see the picture like you know like you and i can see each other well we could normally if the connection was better uh, um i always tend to just look at where the um the what do you call it the camera is lit up at the top of the laptop and then because that that is you're right it's the better eyesight rather than looking down at the screen yeah what about um what about backgrounds it always makes me laugh watching um interviews you know when um <laughs> you get politicians sat in front of a bookcase don't you with some choice books to make them look more intelligent oh yeah <laughs> flat stanley yes with no books in them or something yeah um i i, I again don't overthink it you know I've, I've positioned my chair so that hopefully you can't see the piles of unfiled paper in, uh, a bit behind me in this uh, wonderful uh, not exactly paperless office that i've got but uh, i'm uh, yeah I, you know as long as there's nothing horrible don't worry about it, is, is my mm. suggestion there. Something my camera operator, Paul, often tells people, and he actually says it on our little trailer that we've got on uh, YouTube, is if you're a person who talks, if you're talking to somebody and you're on, uh, there's an actual camera there rather than a, um, a, a webcam. So you've got a camera operator there, a professional. If you're the sort of person who talks with your hands quite a lot, do tell them because then they'll be they'll think right okay well I get a decent shot of the torso so that uh, you can see the hands uh, rather than just do what you do on Zoom, which is just get the odd sort of little uh, thumb hoving into view just occasionally, which is just peculiar. Um, and if you don't talk with your hands, then the camera operator will probably be able to get a much tighter shot on your head, so your face can do all the expressing because you're not that. You know, just be a little bit aware of those things and uh, tip off the camera operator, and you will look uh, significantly upgraded. So. Guy, this show is all about it. It's called it's called from fuck ups to fame. So we tend to talk about and and 
your world is all about crises, dealing with in media interviews. What what is is the one big is the one fuck up in your professional career that you can think of that you've you've done something wrong and you've learned from that you'd you'd like to share? We've had some people share some exclusive ones from losing businesses to all, all sorts of bits and pieces. It always makes for an interesting story because people don't tend to talk about their mistakes, but I think our listeners really enjoy it and that's the theme of the show. So I just wondered if you had anything or are you that good at media training you've never fucked anything up? <laughs> um I it's uh, you, you, everybody has these things uh, happening. Often it's stuff that's beyond your control. We're struggling with a weak internet connection at the moment, uh, and uh, that has been known to uh, mess up uh, entire media training sessions um, before now. Uh, we, we've had uh, Virgin in to uh, repair it, uh, sorry, or, or whichever uh, uh, media company I use. Um, there was once a case uh, where we uh, I've had to abandon things it came very occasionally because of a bad connection. But this is over, you know, about once that's happened over the last uh, 20 years. Um, but, so that's been uh, pretty bad. I've mentioned already the, this, uh, that um, incident with the uh, where I had to uh, conduct interviews for my left man boob. Uh, that was uh, that was pretty bad. I think that, that that's quite memorable as the worst one. Um, the other uh, ones that... Uh, it, it, it tends to be when you've got people who aren't sure why they're there. I was, if I'm interviewing... If I'm um, training somebody... I once had a company where the guy was there, uh, the um, the PR person was there, and a lot of the marketing people were there, and so was the managing director and uh, of, of the client, the end client, and he mm-hmm. felt he was there just to um, support the other people, and yet every time they did a practice interview, his response immediately was, uh, "If you said that in a real interview, I'd sack you," and I was completely at sea. I, you know, I can't possibly say no. You can't sack people like that. I did at one point say to him. And I regret saying to him, I said, well, almost snapped back and said, well, I'd be very interested to uh, cover the story about constructive dismissal if you did so. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, I, th- I think that's probably me not managing people's expectations uh, mm. uh, correctly uh, in many ways. But uh, the, 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 the worst occasions are when the person doesn't think they need, they need any training and uh, they're just there to show off. I mean, after the show, Chris, we'll have to talk about a few of the... Um the media disasters we've seen over the years. I think one one springs to mind, actually, which, which, which we'll talk about. Um, Guy, how can people um, contact you? Do you want to give us some um, your kind of contact details and website and social handles and people can look you up? Absolutely fine. It's really easy, really easy to remember. Um, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn as uh, Guy Clapperton, funnily enough. Um, the, my website is clapperton.co.uk, two Ps, uh, not Clapton. For anybody who wants to know, it's clap button, uh, and um, uh, or just email me guy at clapperton.co.uk, and um, I will uh, endeavour to respond. No, I won't endeavour. I'll be positive. I will respond. I can do emails. <laughs> and um, guy, final question: you've, you've been on the show now. You've been interviewed. Um, you get the, the get the theme of the show. If you were us, who would you next interview for the show, and why? Well, if uh, there were no barriers um, in your place, I would be talking to perhaps Piers Morgan, or perhaps, don't call him Piers, uh, perhaps Piers Morgan, uh, and uh, perhaps I would also uh, be looking at uh, the likes of uh, David Beckham or Robbie Williams to ask them exactly uh, why they did those really terribly bland things where they didn't really answer anything that was exclusively organised by their PR people. However, I suspect back on planet Earth, their PR people would get in your way. Yeah. Zach, that's your challenge, mate. You need to get get, get them Beckham. on the show. You want Beckham and Piers Morgan on the show. Nice, easy, nice, easy <laughs> brief there. Piers Morgan and David Beckham. Can you imagine me interviewing? He'd, inter- he'd interview us, wouldn't he? Can oh, we'd, we'd we'd get we'd, completely owned. Yeah, we we need guys training before we do that interview. He'd own us. Yeah, he would. Guy, thank you very much. That was um, fascinating. Really practical advice there, yeah. and I think um, you know our, our listeners will absolutely. You're more than welcome. Thank that. you for having me. Yeah, thanks for giving it's, your time. It's, and it's my pleasure entirely. Um, yeah, hopefully you'll get a few people giving you a call off the back of this interview. So yeah, thanks very much, and lovely to meet you as well. Okay, so Guy Clapperton then, fascinating chat, media trainer expertise. I think a lot of people out there are always wanting tips, practical things they can take back to their, you know, to their to their internal teams and how to, how to make the C suite communicate properly. And he did have some fascinating insights and tips. What did what did you take from it, Will? Yeah, he really did. I think from my perspective, it it, it made me reflect on some of the uh, interviews I've brokered over the years, and without naming names, brokered. I think 
brokered. Yeah. <laughs> Bro- that's what we do, isn't it? Broker, Bro- broker deals. Um, you'll remember this one. We had a client once, chief exec decided they didn't need media training, they didn't need to prep, and they believed that everything was off the record. And the headline after we got a business profile in their regional press was, this company has been accused of causing cancer. And he basically um, told all these lurid anecdotes about how his company had been accused of X, Y, and Z. He was flirting with the journalist. He was um, he didn't take it particularly seriously, and all of that went into the interview. And yeah, I do was, remember uh, that. It was a horror show, wasn't it? It was shocking, and he had nobody to blame but himself because mm-hmm. we'd actually done a detailed briefing, told him who the journalist was, what sort of thing. But he took it because he had a, a big personality. I remember he took it like he thought he, the journalist was laughing at his anecdotes and playing. But she actually wrote out word for word what he'd said, and it was like, "Did you did you actually say this?" It was a hatchet job. Well, it wasn't a hatchet. Job because he said it all. Yeah, he said that it all. He thought he was doing yeah. it in jest and a journalist will go laugh along with your jokes and yeah. then write it all out. Yeah, So disaster. just be careful for your jokes, I would say. A few other examples. Um, I mean, these, thankfully these aren't, we, we've not uh, presided over these. Um, do you remember the BBC um, interview when that guy who came for a job interview somehow managed to get onto live oh live. yeah yeah that was and brilliant he, 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 he styled it out as yeah, well he's he been asked about the apple share price wasn't he yeah. he, he styled it out and i think he didn't even look shocked either he just carried on he went he thought i think he thought it was part of the interview yeah yeah it was um that was that was that was hilarious and then um yeah that was good the other the other example which it, it you're going to talk ended. about when that guy was in the, having doing a, a like a, a virtual call live on bbc in south korea and his kids no his kids burst in through yeah, the door he's like yeah. a professor wasn't he and then the 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 um his his wife then bursts in bursts and, and drags the child the out. The toddlers come yeah. flying in. It was brilliant. I watch that at least once a month, and it's endlessly entertaining. It is brilliant. We'll have to share the links to yeah, this we'll on, you, on, the, on the show notes. So I think yeah, the lessons are um, preparation, it, preparation, preparation, preparation. You know, never underestimate a media interview, even if it's a short telephone interview ad hoc. You need to prepare and you need to think about your key messages. Yeah. Um, the moment you do, and and it's about authenticity as well, isn't it? You know, it's not about just pushing your company slogan or pushing your key messages. It's about being yourself and being authentic. And don't be vanilla. Like like we talk like I was talking about the article in the, the Telegraph. Like a lot of celebrities and sports personalities are vanilla and it's the ones that actually it's your Jack Grealishes of the world who step into the DJ box and you know the ones with a better personality are the ones but Bearing in mind, if we're talking to commercial clients, we can't tell them to have too, not, too much personality. Not too much personality. Yeah, it's like yeah. getting that balance right between being, you know, have your own personality. As Will says, be authentic, mm-hmm. but but don't go fully what that client who did, who just thought they could make as many jokes for the journalist and it all got written out word for word verbatim. And he had nobody to blame except mm. for himself. Mm. Um, you live and learn. You do. Well, he, he did. He does anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us this week on Social Unacceptable. Uh, tune in in two weeks' time and we'll have another episode for you. If you like the show, please do subscribe. We need every single subscriber we can get. And also, um, if you like the show, please leave a comment and let us know what you think. If you want to be on the show as well, just go to sociallyunacceptable.co.uk uh, and send us an email and tell us why you should be on the show because we want to hear all about your fuck-ups. So keep on fucking up and we'll see you soon. Thank you for listening to Socially Unacceptable. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a five-star review. Don't forget to follow us on social media on Instagram, TikTok and LinkedIn at Prohibition PR and Twitter at Socially UA. We would love to hear some of your career fuck-ups so we can share them on the show. For more information on the show, search Prohibition PR in your search engine and click on podcasts. Until next time, please keep pushing the boundaries and embracing the socially unacceptable. Socially unacceptable.